For today's webinar, we're going to be talking about staffing websites, and as the title says, strategies for this year and beyond. Um, really excited to be on today's call with uh, Mark from our creative team. Mark builds a lot of staffing websites, uh, and uh, the two of us are going to take a look at some of the things that we're seeing in websites, some of the, the challenges that we commonly see, and then more importantly, the things that you need to be considering either in improving the site that you have today or as you plan for the next generation of your website, whenever that will be. So we're gonna just sort of jump right in. We've got a ton of stuff to talk about. So let's start with what's wrong. You know, what do we see in staffing websites that's going wrong? Well, honestly, if we had had this webinar two, three years ago, I would have filled this screen with the things that we see companies doing wrong. But we actually see the staffing industry over the last two or three years, websites have gotten significantly better. We're seeing bolder designs. There was a time not so long ago, and there's still maybe some people on today's webinar who feel this way, where everybody was safe. They didn't, they were really conservative. We didn't want to offend anybody. So people built websites that were kind of boring. Now we're seeing much bolder designs. We're seeing more original or at least unique imagery, more modification of the standard stock images or choosing images that are different than everybody else. Best of all, people that are actually getting photography shot that represents their team, their company, their geographic market or their industry. We're seeing much more engaging copy. Um, it's shorter, it's stronger, it gets to the point, it conveys a unique message. We're also seeing better features. A good website is really not about saying what you do. It's about engaging your clients and candidates. It's about pulling employers and job seekers in and getting them to take action. And we're seeing many more features, better job board integration, better calls to action. And most importantly, that uh, we are seeing almost universal mobile optimization. And I said almost universal because it's not really universal. I'm particularly still in the job apply process. Um, for everybody's benefit, in December 2018, um, we hit a milestone. We track analytics on lots and lots, hundreds, and I think it's actually now over a thousand staffing and recruiting websites where we're looking at the data. And we're seeing how people are using your websites. And in December of 2018, the milestone we hit is that was not the first month we had ever seen more mobile traffic than desktop traffic, but that was the beginning of it being consistent that every single month since last December, mobile traffic on staffing websites has been greater than desktop traffic. That means if your website can't be used by someone who's going to search and apply for a job from their phone, uh, you're losing at least 50 and maybe a 70 or 80 percent of your job seeker traffic. But despite all the good stuff, um, staffing websites are still full of leaks. And by leaks, you know, we're, they're leaking talent. You're losing people. Let's work backwards. You know, the biggest leak, the single greatest barrier to people applying to your jobs is probably the application itself, either the ATS integration or the form that's being used. We're seeing some, not all, some application forms with 80, 85, 90% abandonment rates, meaning you got the candidate to the job, they're trying to apply and they give up before they finish it. Um, that is the biggest thing to be fixed on most staffing websites, but also getting people from the job post to the apply process. And we'll talk about how to get more people to click apply. And then there's searching jobs and how people can find the most relevant ones. Uh, sometimes it's really intuitive. Sometimes it doesn't make sense at all. We're going to talk about some of those examples in a little bit. Then there are options for candidates who are not ready to apply. Uh, you may have heard us talk about on previous Lunch with Haley webinars that a candidate who returns to your website a second time is twice as likely to apply for a job. So what are you doing for the first time visitor who's really not ready to apply? Maybe they're just not ready to quit their current job. Maybe they have questions for you. What options do you give them? Then there's lack of calls to action or weak calls to action. Just we're not telling people what we want them to do. 
We're not directing candidates to take the next step. Then there's the entry pages. People come into your website on lots of different entry pages. It's not just the home page. If I look at most staffing websites, a lot of time and attention was put into designing the home page. And that still is probably going to be the number one place people enter your website. But what about people who come directly in to a job post, directly into a blog post, directly to a locations page or your contact page? Are those pages optimized to convert? And then on the client side, that was just all on the candidate side. Client side, lack of differentiation. Uh, is the website telling your story in a way that an employer could say, wow, this is a company that sounds a little different, interesting. They don't just sound and look like everybody else. Are you clearly conveying the value you can deliver to the employer? How do you make their lives better? How do you help them reduce costs? How do you help them hire more quickly? If it's just about, hey, we're very responsive and hey, we ask great questions and our service is incredible and we provide better candidates, those are all good things, but they don't differentiate, they don't clearly convey the value you're able to deliver. Um, pretty frequently, we see there are no calls to action for employers. Uh, maybe you're hoping they find your contact page, but there's nothing else for the employer to do to actually start to engage your company from your website. And again, entry pages that fail to convert. So Mark, I just gave a long list of bullets on things that talent and clients uh, might uh, be needed to improve to get more conversions. Anything else that you see when you're going to update a website, other problems that I haven't talked about? Yeah, sure, David. Um, the one thing that we see a lot, and I really want to focus on differentiation, this isn't limited to just staffing websites, but the internet as a whole. You'll see a lot of websites look very similar nowadays, and the ones that kind of push the envelope in terms of design and functionality are the ones that get seen, get shared, and get used. Yeah, it's so funny. I was like, I've been thinking and looking at a lot of websites. It's like somebody sold one master template that every company in the planet has decided they must use. Uh, not that it's a bad thing to give people a user experience they're familiar with. That's actually a very good thing. But then we have to really go further. If we've got a similar page layout, maybe that same tall page structure, how do we make it really unique to our brand? And it's got calls to action that really fit what we want people to do. Thanks, Mark. All right, so now let's get to the good stuff. Let's, we're gonna go through a lot of these leaks and then the specific strategies. I think in total, we have 12 strategies we're going to cover to try to drive response, to get clients to contact you, to get candidates applying to more of your jobs. So starting at the top, let's start with the beginning, your homepage. So the homepage leaks, most common ones. Number one, filling the three second rule. Now what that means, in three seconds or less, can I look at your website and understand who you are, what you do, what makes you stand out, and what I should do next? So that's a lot to do in three seconds. So you have to keep it really simple and a combination of the right imagery and the right words, the right direction of people to make it pass this test. The example you see on screen, some of it's it's really not that bad. It's it's fairly attractive. I don't love the layout of the text. I think four lines in that particular font are not that easy to read. It's not enough color contrast between the purple and the black. But we empower our clients through people, technology, and resilience. It's not a bad message, but it doesn't even say what they do. It assumes someone coming to their website knows the services they provide. It doesn't really talk about the value that they're delivering. They're empowering clients. Does a client feel like they need to be empowered? Does that make sense? Is there anything on here for talent at all? Um, the navigation bar, people as a service, advanced technologies, recovery services, newsroom, company. Some of those are good. I like people as a service. I like recovery services. Newsroom, company makes sense. Advanced technologies doesn't make sense to me. So everything on your website in just a few seconds needs to be obvious and intuitive. No clear call to action. So if you came to this website, the only thing that's a button and it's a gray box that says about us, um, is that what you want to click on first? The number one visitor to your website is a job seeker. What does a job seeker want? How are you getting them to what they want? 
And then lastly, which you can't see, and I don't know if this site was particularly a problem, but slight sites that are too slow to load. Anything over two seconds is really going to impede people waiting around, particularly on mobile. So you want to look at strategies for getting your site to be faster, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. All right. So strategy number one to deal with this is we want to optimize your home page to drive response. So some of the things we look at, number one, deliberate messaging. Think about the audience. Is my website going to be an even mix of clients and candidates? Is it going to be more skewed to one audience versus the other? Write your message for your primary audience. Write your message around the take home, the that you want them to get. And think about it like a billboard. If you were zooming down the highway at, at of course, no faster than 65 miles an hour, uh, depending on where you live, but if you're zooming down the highway and you see a billboard, you're not going to remember a long, drawn out message. You're going to remember something that's quick, to the point, and resonates with you as you're passing by. Well, your website, people scroll so quickly, it's the equivalent of a car zooming down the highway. What's your deliberate message? Here, Great jobs, talented people, and exceptional results. Working Solutions is your flexible employment specialist. It says what they do, says the value proposition, pretty clear, but it's done in two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, less than 15 words. The main headline is only seven words. Get, it's easy to read. Less copy goes right along with it. I've seen lots of websites that there's a good message, but they're written in paragraphs of text. And probably some SEO advisor told you that, hey, you need to have 500 plus words on every page of your website. From an SEO perspective, you want pages with long copy, absolutely. But the pages that humans come to first, less is more. They need to be able to get your message and figure out what the page is all about. And if they have to read long paragraphs, they're not gonna do it. And that's why you're seeing more and more websites writing short copy. Now, it may be fewer words. That doesn't mean it's easier to write. I think there's that famous Mark Twain quote, I would have written you a shorter letter if only I had had more time. That absolutely applies to your website because you have to agonize over how to cut down the message to what matters most to your audience. Multiple calls to action. So what do you have on this page here? Okay, we've got get hired, hire talent message for job seekers, message for employers. We have a fly-in on the right side. We're hiring, search now. Their primary audience are job seekers. That fly-in grabs your eyeballs as it opens up and it drives you to searching their jobs. Okay, let's say you didn't take action in that very top of the screen you're scrolling down. Big blue box, offset with white text. You deserve to love your job. Let Working Solutions find the job you were made to do and now you can search their jobs. So we've got calls to action surrounding the visitor as they just start to scroll down the page. Not so much that it's obnoxious, but attractive, well-designed, well-segmented calls to action on this page. Before we move on, Mark, anything else that, that you see at the homepage level that you want to recommend companies do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think nowadays that people are so used to scrolling just in general. Uh, we, we scroll all day on our smartphones. So the concept of having content above the fold while isn't totally dead is still important. And you want to provide the path of least resistance to your visitors. So get that important stuff out there right away. Yeah, and Mark's exactly right. I think everybody's used to scrolling websites and, and particularly on mobile, you're going to have websites that scroll vertically. On desktop, most of sites now scroll vertically, but that first three second view has to have the message and those first calls to action. That's why you see this particular website, you start to see the blue box as you scroll, but you've got the left and right calls to action before you, you do anything else. All right, speed. So you want a website that loads fast. You can run Google's PageSpeed Insights for mobile and desktop. And ideally you want a score that's in that green area of 90 plus for speed. Now, this is all technical stuff. This is what guys like Mark do. This is not my area of expertise, but some of the things that we do, Mark, maybe you want to kind of just walk through these bullets, what, what we're doing here when we're building a site. Sure, so there's a lot of steps that we can take during the build of the site and after the site goes live to get the speed up and maintain the speed. And a lot of this involves stuff that's done in the actual build process. So when we write the code for the site, after we finish writing it, we minimize it. And that means getting rid of any extra spaces. It won't change how the site loads or how the site reads, but it'll change how quickly it loads by saving on file space. 
And then cache content, we utilize both browser caching and server caching to make sure that once the content is loaded once, if it hasn't changed, it's available right away instead of having to be reloaded again. With images, we try to compress them to be as small as possible without sacrificing quality. So that way they look good, but they load quickly. And then with plugins, we want to do as much as we can natively within the website. And that means having to rely on less assets by just building it directly into the site instead of relying on a third party. All right, and I'll jump on the last one is, is really look at a web host that is specifically built uh, design their servers around the type of website you have. So for example, we build all of our websites in WordPress. Why? It's open source. So if for any reason Haley Marketing disappeared, you could take your site to developers anywhere on the planet and they could edit the site for you. Something like a third of all websites in the world are built on WordPress. But there are lots of companies that can host a WordPress website. We used to host all of our sites at Rackspace. And we had something like 60 servers at Rackspace we were using to host our clients' websites. Well, along came a company called WP Engine, and we partnered with them because all they do is WordPress hosting and sites run faster, more reliably on WP Engine. Now, they have some rules we have to live by um, to make sure that the sites work well for them. Some of that plugin stuff affect that they restrict the use of certain plugins, but the optimized hosting helps lead to better site performance. And as a staffing executive, you really don't want to think about any of these technical considerations, but you want to ask your web developer, are you doing these things to help our site perform as well as it can? All right, then there's the site navigation leaks. So when somebody comes to your website, they have to know how to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. First and biggest and most common leak is just like you see the picture on the screen right now, a structure that is not aligned with user intent. What does that mean? Well, think about who's using your website and why they're coming there. The particular photo on screen shows a website that started the first thing is about, then clients, then candidates, then jobs. Who's the number one visitor to your website? It's candidates. What do they want more than anything else? Job information. That's the fourth thing in the navigation on this particular company site. Uh, I know a lot of staffing companies still have about us as the first thing. Yes, you can find it if it's not, you know, you don't have to read left to right to find something. But again, in three seconds, people's eyeballs, at least in the US and North America, start on the left side and go to the right. So we want to make sure that on the left side nav, that first option is the most important thing people want to do. And then other things like contact us. People are used to seeing it at the right end. Here, it's not in the navigation at all. So now if I want to contact this company, I don't know where to go. I have to find it. Is it under locations? Is it under news? Is it under candidates? Is it under about? I don't know where the contact form is. Here, the structure is not aligned with the way people might use this website. We also don't want to make people have to click too many times. The more clicks, the fewer people are going to click. The more times the new page has to load, the more people are going to disappear waiting for the page load. So we want to make it as easy as possible, ideally one click from wherever you are to wherever you want to go. And then not being optimized for mobile and desktop. It's a personal pet peeve, but I think it's a really bad practice is we see a lot of companies that built websites. And this is a trend in the last several years to be mobile first. And so that little three line thing they call a hamburger menu, which we're used to seeing on our smartphone, that opens up your navigation. Well, a lot of designers said, hey, let's make it cleaner on the desktop and let's make that our navigation on desktop because people are used to how it works. Intuitively, that makes a lot of sense. But from a user experience standpoint, I've now required people to click before they even can see what the navigation Again, if I have to click to figure out where to go on your website, I might do it if I'm really inclined to look for a job with you. But if I just found your website and it's more clicks to get to your jobs than it is your competitor's site, I'm just going to leave and go to your competitor's site. So why not take advantage of navigation the way it should be on desktop, which is spelled out on the screen somewhere, and then minimize it behind the hamburger menu on mobile. Or I've seen on desktop a hybrid where only the most critical things are visible all the time, and the less important navigation is behind the hamburger menu. All right, so how do we fix this? First thing we want to do is called information architecture, which is really thinking about 
the visitors to your site, which typically are going to fall into at least four categories, job seekers who are looking for job information, employers who may be looking for a staffing company, your current temporary field associates or contractors, and your current clients. Those are four different types of visitors to your website, and each of those types of people wants to find different content on your website. So what you want to do is sit down, just like the diagram you see here, is on map it all out. Where do we want to put the content on our website so that it makes the most sense based on what people want to do? And how do we get people to the pages they want as cleanly and easily as possible? How do we make it intuitive? So this diagram is what you do to sort of think about the structure of all the pages and the functionality of the site. Then you want to think about intuitive navigation. This is the order of things in the menu, also what you name them. Here you see the example, it shows jobs, services, specialties, about, blog, contact us. The idea is that most of these are just one word because it keeps it very clean to have fewer words. I've seen other sites where I really love what they do where it'll say, you know, looking for work, need to hire. So they'll use phrases for the navigation so that it's more intuitive what's behind each menu item. What you want to think about is what prompts would make the most sense to the clients and candidates you're serving, to the job seekers and employers. How do we make it obvious for them what they need to do? Then we want to think about the appropriate variations for mobile and desktop. And so again, on desktop, Let's use a horizontal navigation where we can see the options. On mobile, everything behind the, the hamburger menu. Or as I mentioned, let's think about the hybrid version so that if we've got deep navigation, we don't have to overwhelm someone visiting the desktop site. It's below a, a hamburger menu, but the critical things are at the top of the page. On technology company websites, you often see there will be four or five really critical things at the top, and then they'll put other navigation for, like on a lot of software company websites, the about us information is that important. So they'll put that in the footer, information about the company or a lot of their useful resources may be in the footer rather than in the top navigation. That's what you want to think about is where do I put the navigation, desktop and mobile, so that it will make the most sense and be the easiest to use for my site visitors. Mark, let's talk a little bit about this one. So not everybody wants to do a large format dropdown, but why is it sometimes a good idea? It's a good idea because you can give your viewers context about the pages that they're about to see or navigate into, as well as you can provide another call to action to get them to go exactly where you'd like them to go. Yeah, and the other thing I like about it is as you're taking your mouse and you're scrolling over the, the main menu items, assuming the navigation bar is changing, now I can go from any page to any other page in one click. And I also can get an instant overview of what's in every section of the website. So most websites will have some sort of drop down. For example, if I put my mouse over looking for work here, I'd see overview hiring process. But making this larger format dropdown, as Mark said, gives you the opportunity to have either more content or another call to action. It also makes your navigation stand out a little bit more and makes the navigation easier to use. It's not right all the time. If you've got a very simple site with, with only a few sub pages, large format dropdowns would be overkill. But if you've got a deep site, this is a great way to make it easy from peop for people to navigate anywhere they want to go. And we can also provide, oh, sorry, David. Oh, go ahead. If I could, yeah, we can also provide additional functionality in the large format dropdowns. So one of the things that we've been doing on a number of websites recently is especially in the candidate section is providing a featured job feed directly in the large format dropdown to, for candidates to see what jobs are available right away. Awesome, thanks, I didn't even think about that, but yeah, you can put dynamic content um, in there. So even if someone's on any page scrolling the website, you're bringing to them the information they most want and you're, again, driving another call to action. Great addition, thanks, Mark. All right, now we're gonna talk about entry page leaks. So the idea here, there's no conversion path. So when somebody comes to your website, if they come into the home page, there should be a conversion path. They come into, you can see the diagram on the right illustrates how that works. They come to the website page, they see a call to action. The call to action leads to a, a subsequent page where then they can engage with you. 
So here we've got a specific call to action, you get a freebie, you go to a landing page for the freebie, you fill out the form, sales gets a lead. Now, it's not always going to be where you're going to a landing page, but we always want to have a conversion path. We're thinking about what comes next. And then we want to think about it from the most common pages people use to enter your website. So we're going to do the home page first. That's the most common. Then we're going to look at your blog posts. And does your blog have a conversion path? Is it designed to get people to take action? Then your locations pages, because a lot of people come into your website, they're looking for a phone number, they're looking for directions. And so they're gonna go directly to a locations page. Well, do you have calls to action to make sure they can find your information, they can call you if they're particularly on mobile, um, that they can search jobs, that they can opt in for content. Same with the contact page. I see a lot of staffing company contact pages where the only thing listed is the address and phone number of the office. There's no form, there's no chat, there's no other way to engage the staffing company on the contact page you're making the visitor do a lot of work to reach out to you and the more work they have to do the less people are going to do it and then also pages like your job seekers page or the top level of your employers page what's the conversion path from those if those are just brochure pages that don't drive people to taking action well you're not going to get the kind of response that you want to get so how do we design your website for conversion we think about the types of activities people want to do and how we add those activities to the website. So the first thing we can do is feature jobs. Mark just mentioned we could put feature jobs into a large format dropdown. We can have feature jobs on the home page of the website. We can have it at the top of the job seeker page. You can have it on the sidebar of a blog. You can have it on the contact us page, but you can t you want to make sure that you can take feature jobs and feature them throughout your website. Uh, the majority of staffing sites don't include feature jobs throughout the site. Maybe they'll be on the home page. Maybe they'll be on uh, the job search page, but very often they're not there at all. Then a search widget, which means I have the ability to search jobs. Can we embed that in the site horizontally, vertically, in different places? You saw the example up front where we had the you deserve to love your job widget, which we could just drop right onto the home page. But can we put a widget on the home page, on the contact page, on the blog page? So wherever a candidate starts coming into your website, you give them the ability to run a search based on keyword, location, industry. How about internal links? Are you creating links to re relevant related content? This is particularly important in a blog. Am I linking from one post to something else people would be interested in? Am I create those internal links are good for SEO, but they're even better for humans because it gets them to more content they're interested in and it keeps them on your site longer. And then the thinking through all kinds of calls to actions. So people can search jobs, they can opt in for a job alert, they can download free content, they can request an employee, they can search featured talent and mark um, what else am I forgetting that they might be able to do uh, or any other ideas you have to try to design a page for conversion. It all goes back to making it as easy as possible for your visitors. So especially with featured jobs, filter those jobs. Let's say if you have specialty pages, for the types of staffing that your company does, filter those jobs so that each specialty has those jobs displaying on those pages. Awesome, yeah, location pages too. If every branch office has its own location page, which from an SEO perspective, it absolutely should, we can bring feature jobs in for that branch. You can bring blog posts in for that branch. Uh, and then lastly, you see on the screen in the bottom right corner is chat. So give people an option to interact with you Live chat, possibly. We're a big proponent of having a chat bot or automated chat that's available. During business hours, you can have a human monitor that so they can jump in. In the example you see on the screen, Frontline Source Group, uh, their live chat is one of their top sources for new business because whenever a prospective client gets on their website, hey, they've got within 60 seconds a live human being talking to that prospective client. When it's a candidate, they don't They'll, they'll direct, they'll use the bot to answer the candidate's questions and direct the candidate to searching jobs. But chat is another great way to create engagement and the, the hybrid approach where there is an automated or bot that can start the conversation with during business hours, a live human monitoring it who can jump in and take over for the bot. It's probably the best combination.
There are also some new players providing more AI-based chats that are really sophisticated that can help to engage talent, actually screen talent, qualify talent, and schedule interviews. All right, now we're going to get to the biggie, career portal leaks. So we mentioned some of them earlier. Number one, searching and filtering. So is it easy for people to be able to find jobs? You see on the screen here an example of, of a common search, search by keyword or location. And at first glance, it looks attractive. It's intuitive. They filled in the boxes with prompts. But they're saying search by job title or category. Search by city, state, or zip code. If I'm doing a Google search and I came across this company's website, how do I know what categories they have? How do I know where their jobs are? I could type in anything I want and there might be no matches. So you wanna make sure if you've got the ability to give people a search tool, a search widget, that you make it easy to complete, usually for fields like category or location, a dropdown or a radius search, type in a zip code and get so many miles around that zip code so it doesn't have to be an exact match. Then the apply process. What are we doing to make it easier for people to apply? We'll look at that in a minute. How about alternatives to apply? A lot of people come to your website and they may be looking at jobs but not really ready to submit their resume. Um, that's very traumatic to commit to looking for a job. If I'm a passive job seeker, I may have a ton of questions before I give you my resume. So what alternatives are you giving me to engage with you? How about search engine optimization in Google for jobs? Is your site making sure every job is individually optimized for SEO on all search engines and specifically, is it optimized for Google for jobs? We'll show you that in just a minute. And then how about talent re-engagement? A large percentage of candidates do not apply the first time they visit your website. So what are you doing to bring them back? I mean, think about all of the money you spend on recruitment advertising only to bring people there the first time. What's your budget to bring those people back? If you knew that the person coming back was actually twice as likely to apply to a job, you put a lot of effort into bringing people back. Yet, most staffing websites, most staffing companies are spending little to nothing on programs for talent re-engagement. So let's take a look at these. Number one, get a better career portal, okay? This is probably the only part of today's webinar which is a bit self-promotional, um, but, we see so many bad career portals and we've designed ours by looking at just about everybody in the industry, staffing industry and outside to design a career portal that minimizes talent loss. So searching and filtering, some decisions you can make using our software just on your own site. Do I want to allow people to search jobs or display all jobs when they first go to look at jobs in your website. The rule of thumb I would give you is if there's more jobs than fit on one screen, and that might be 10 or 15 jobs, then you want a search capability. If you don't have more jobs than fit on a screen, then take people directly to, here's a listing of our job openings. And you want your software to be able to, just with a click of a switch, change between show people the search or show people a list. Do you provide drop-down lists and or type ahead? So as people are trying to figure out what to search for, you're making it easy by showing them the choices. Are you giving people a radius search? A lot of people think I want a job that is a certain distance from my home because of travel time. Um, Google wants people to be able to do a search that says find jobs near me and you can choose your distance. Does your website career portal allow you to do a radius search? You see it on screen there, it says radius 50 miles. People can do a search just by moving a little slide bar how far they're willing to travel for a job. How about the apply process? The general rule of thumb is, in any web form is anything over three fields starts to diminish response. So when it comes to getting applications, hey, three fields isn't enough for you to qualify a candidate. So we wanna think about how could we break the process into multiple steps. Step one, get the candidate's name and email address. They're interested in the job. That way, if they quit, now we can follow up and say, hey, thanks so much for starting to apply. You know, we'd love to, to see your resume. Could you complete our application process? or collect the resume on step one, and then ask them to go back and do the full application form on step two. 
the majority of talent loss on staffing websites is when you go straight to the ATS based application form and there's five pages of questions. Um, my personal favorites are the ones where on page one you have to put in the last four digits of your social security number in order to start the application process. Maybe my favorite one is too, you have to register just to search for jobs. Any friction you create, like register to search for a job or enter any part of your social security number. Number one, nobody wants to do that for security reasons. Number two, how many people know their social security number off the top of their head? We want to eliminate that and simplify it. And then last bullet here is one click apply options. And on screen, you see sort of an extreme of examples. So, you know, this is everything we can turn on in our job board software. Apply with Indeed, Monster, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Instagram. What we're trying to see is anywhere somebody might already have their basic contact information, let's allow them to grab that information from a third party source. So, I wouldn't recommend turning on this many options. However, I would absolutely recommend finding ways to add one click apply. For a lot of our clients, even though Indeed won't take your free job postings anymore, they still let you use apply with Indeed. And we're seeing particularly light industrial cl clients who 25% or more of the candidates click apply with Indeed. Uh, Monster has the one click apply. There's a question that just came in about using LinkedIn. You can use LinkedIn to get sign-in information. Unfortunately, uh, LinkedIn used to allow us to grab the entire profile and LinkedIn took that away. Um, for a while, they had some preferred partners they were giving it to and then I think when IBM took over, they took it even more away. LinkedIn wants you to apply, to put all your jobs on LinkedIn and have people applying there. But I would absolutely recommend using the apply with LinkedIn to grab the public profile information, which is just their contact information, using that to fill out the beginning of the form so that you can then come back and gather more once you've gotten the basics. Search engine optimization on your career portal. So right now on your website, is every job an individual page, its own web page? It has its own URL. Is every job on your domain, and you see the arrows at the top of the screen showing some of the things we're gonna look at. So in the URL bar, which is the arrow that's on the right-hand side, you, know, you can see this is a job from our website, jobs.haleymarketing.com. It's on our domain. And then in the URL, it says Senior UI Designer Developer Jobs in Buffalo, New York. That's our job. That's the location. So it's got the job title, the word jobs, the location, all part of the URL, and it's its own web page. That's all part of SEO. The arrow on the upper left shows you that the the page title, the name of the page says Senior UI Developer, Designer Developer. That's done in the on-page metadata. So what we're trying to do is set the page title and we're setting headlines and subheadlines so that when any search engine is going through your web page, it can organize the information and know what this page is about. And if you think I've got 10 jobs, 20 jobs, 50 jobs, we've got some clients with 5,000 jobs in their website, that's like having a website with 5,000 additional pages all optimized for search engines. If your site doesn't have a separate page for every job and you're not optimizing every page, you're losing out on tremendous SEO value. Then there's Google for jobs. So this is something that you, you can't do on your own. It has to be done behind the scenes with something called structured data. So the idea is that as the jobs, you put them into your ATS, the ATS pushes them into your career software. Your career software takes every job and it takes important information about that job and breaks it into fields that Google can understand. So you see on the right-hand side of the screen, it says test your structured data. This is Google's structured data testing tool. So for example, if you what, took the URL of a job and you pasted it into that box because you went to Google and looked for that, that structured data testing tool, it will then bring up the window on the bottom, which shows you on the left-hand side what the code of your website looks like, what this page, how it, the HTML code is structured. But the right-hand side shows you everything Google knows about your job. If there's nothing there, you don't have any structured data. It will also show you the number of errors and warnings 
based on the data that's missing. If there are any errors, Google will not display your job in the Google for Jobs window. If there are warnings, that will limit how you're shown. And you want to see, do we want to get rid of the warnings? Now, for most staffing companies, there's two really controversial pieces of data. Number one is salary. Do you want to include that? The answer should be yes. Even if the salary is not great, jobs with salaries get more applications than jobs that don't have them, and Google wants that data. However, the really controversial one is the location of the job itself. Believe it or not, Google wants to know where the job site is so they can help candidates find jobs that are convenient to their location. Most staffing and recruiting firms do not want to include that. And even though in our own career portal software, we give you the option to include it and we don't visually display it on the page, we only put it in the structured data, it is in that structured data. So a really savvy competitor could dig into the source code of your pages and figure out where your jobs are. My view, my thought on that is, who cares? If you're gonna lose a client because a competitor knows where your job is, you're probably gonna lose that client anyway. If your relationship is only as good as that proprietary knowledge of who my customers are, you gotta work on the relationships. And you also have to assume every client you have is already being called on by the competition. So the more you can do to fill the jobs faster, that's what's going to retain the client, much more so than worrying about does Google for Jobs know the location and could somebody figure it out. Then there's talent re-engagement. So thinking about can I get people the ability to opt in for job alerts? Can I set up category mailings, email marketing that automatically notify people when relevant jobs are posted? Can I do retargeting, which is paid advertising through Google and through Facebook? So somebody who comes to your website and searches your jobs, you can now have your jobs follow them around to try to get them to, hey, I, you, know, you applied to a job. Well, check out the other 25 jobs we have available. Or you didn't finish the applying. Come back and finish. Or thanks so much for checking jobs on our website. Um, we have new jobs every week. Come see us again. The retargeting advertising can follow people around as they go anywhere in Google's display network of 2 million plus websites or the you know, 8 to 10 times a day they're on Facebook. You can be advertising to them and it's a very low cost form of marketing to stay top of mind with your candidates. So through job alerts, category mailings, you're using email marketing, the retargeting you're using search engine, social media to stay in front of your candidates to bring them back. All right, and strategy number seven that's related to your career portal is to expand your calls to actions. Lots of options other than apply. And Mark, from a designer's perspective, you know, how should people be thinking about using all of these calls to action on their website? You want to kind of space them out as much as possible so that they're not overwhelming, but you've got a variety of options to drive your response, whether it's getting somebody to sign up for a newsletter or to go to a next page or go to a contact form. And differentiating the design and the placement of these will really help you kind of not, uh, not overpower your site. And I want to think about different ways to have the calls to action as well. Sometimes it might be a fly-in. Sometimes it might be in a sidebar. Sometimes it might be in line, like in the middle of a blog post or in line in the middle of a page. Sometimes it might be just text links. Sometimes it might be buttons. And so on screen, you see some pictures of just different examples. Um, one, one example I want to highlight is chat with a recruiter. A lot of times, particularly if you're dealing with healthcare, IT, engineering, accounting and finance, scientific, the higher skill positions, the candidates are gonna have questions before, and they're gonna to wanna to get those questions answered before they just send you a resume. So that's why we partnered with Flash Recruit and we added their ability to chat with a recruiter to our job board software. So if you're using our software and you're using Flash Recruit, a candidate can click that button. It goes out and tries to get the recruiter working on the job to engage the candidate in a live chat. And if the recruiter is not available, it falls back to a bot to answer questions or gather the questions that the recruiter can then follow up to. Um, but if you think about all of the reasons other than apply, apply later, the chat, the email and texting based job alerts, submitting referrals, sharing content on social media or offering people free content like a newsletter or a salary guide, 
the more you can have strong calls to action, the more you will engage the talent so that you can bring them back to your jobs down the road. All right, let's talk about content leaks. And so, we, so far we focused a lot about on design and functionality, but let's talk about the copy itself. Too often it's dull or me too. Uh, there's the picture you see on screen is, is part of our website development process. We call it the ABCs, where we help people think about A, the appearance of their website, B, the, the critical business information they're going to want to include, but C is the core messaging. And that's the, you know, this, this booklet that we give out. This is actually the majority of the pages are all on core messaging, understanding the most important points you want to make, and then getting them down to the small number of words that you actually want to put into the website and what you can do to really differentiate yourself. Then thinking through beyond just the copy, what kinds of calls to action do you want to have and how do we make the calls to action, how do we word them so they're as strong and motivating as possible? Avoid being too wordy. As I mentioned at the beginning, we want long copy, but we want long copy deeper in the site. So for example, let's say you've got a four different vertical market specialties. That Those specialty pages are a great place for long copy, but I wouldn't put the long copy on the home page. I wouldn't put it just on our services page. And even if you have a specialties page at the very top level, I'd give an overview of all the specialties so a human can see what you do very quickly. Then I'd have a page on each individual specialty with long copy because that page is going to be awesome for search engines. So you want to be wordy deep in your site where it's great for non-human readers and you want to cut the words down at the high up pages in your website the people pages people see first so they get the gist of what you do without having to do a lot of reading go through a lot of work all right so mark i, I know this is one you designed so talk to us a little bit about and I'll, I'll bring up some of the bullets here but what did you do to help get the message out on this site Sorry, I was muted for a second. Uh, with this one in particular, we wanted the imagery to really serve as the backing to the copy. The copy is really straightforward. It's right in your face. And we wanted the imagery to provide a nice background to it. So we went with very simple illustrated style imagery and it's all very technical. It showcases the client's, uh, the client's home city, which is Chicago in this case. And we really wanted to just keep it out of the way of the copy. The other thing I like that you did is um, the headlines and subheads is thinking about, yeah, you know, people tend to skim before they read. So using the font size, using the length of the, the headlines and subheads so that somebody could scroll, visually scroll through the text, even as they're zipping by on their phone or they're zipping by on their computer. And then if they want to read something with more detail, the body copy is available, but the headlines and subheads tell the story first. And, and I really like the elements of design, how design married a copy in this particular site. Talk to a little bit about conversion pass. What did you, what did you do throughout this site? And what do you do through a lot of that sites to create the conversion pass? We're using a lot of big and obvious calls to action here. And in this one in particular, you can see on the homepage uh, screenshot right there, there's two large call to action buttons. The one on the right is the one that's being hovered on. And when it's hovered on, that button gets a little bigger. It creates a drop shadow and it changes the color. So we want to make it obvious that this is the action that you should take. We did this all over the site. And that, that includes buttons on the pages, it includes the text links, it includes stuff like the job board search and feature jobs as well. Awesome, thank you. All right, and now I know we're gonna get to one of your favorite areas, design leaks. So I'll, I'll cover the leaks and you can cover the uh, strategies for fixing them, but outdated design. Um, we often see designs that the branding of the site really doesn't match the message the staffing company wants to give or their, their vision, their services have changed, but their website hasn't been updated. And then the picture that you see on screen, the, of course, all things stock image, it's all job titles and all ethnicities and all ages, all, yeah, it's all everything. And when you're everything to everybody, you're nothing to anyone. So we don't want the all things stock images. Yes, we may want to show diversity throughout the site, but we don't have to do it in every individual picture. 
um, designs that fail to drive response. They're pretty, but they're not designed to bring people to taking action. And then kind of going back to where we were a while ago, the design itself is not optimized for desktop and mobile. It's really, you know, for years we've heard people talk about responsive design, meaning the design responds, it adjusts to desktop and mobile, but a really good mobile design does more than just respond. And we'll see an example of that in just a minute. All right, so designing for response. Let's uh, let's talk about this strategy, Mark. I'll go through some of the, some of the bullets and you can kind of cover what we did. Sure. Uh, this this client in particular, they've got a very bold logo. I mean, their colors are orange, blue, and green. They're very vibrant. They're they're in your face. And so we wanted the home page to be that as soon as you loaded it up. And this is the first image that you see. This website actually has a home page slideshow, which uh, slides through four different images of people, the kinds of people that this client places. And they're all vibrant. Each photo has one of their colors as the background. And if there's a lot of motion, there's a lot of character. But at the same time, using that solid color, we're able to make the text stand out. We're able to make the CTA stand out and it, the actions are obvious. And one of the things I really like, this is a great example of not just using stock photos. So we found a stock photo that certainly doesn't look like every other staffing company. This doesn't look like your typical light industrial temporary um, wearing a safety vest. But this is some, this woman here, she's very happy, she's engaging. Uh, the, the fact that her picture was masked and then we had a solid color, a gradient color behind it, it just, it creates a really inviting effect, even though we're still using stock photography. And as you mentioned, the, I don't have a picture of it here because it's just a PowerPoint, but even the, there's a fly-in on this particular website that's got just a great way to get people to search jobs. It brings in another person who's, who's there in a photo, basically encouraging people right away to, to apply for a job. And, and I think that combination of a really bold call to action and the use of the bold imagery is phenomenal on this site. Um, how about thinking behind, beyond responsive? What, what about here? Sure. Um, with smartphones nowadays, we've got all sorts of different screen sizes and operating systems. So you want to make it as intuitive as possible. And the example on screen here, this is something we do with every one of our websites, where on mobile, we have a quick action bar that goes on the bottom of every page. And those are customizable to the client, to the website. But there are actions that we want the visitor to take, whether it's calling us or having them go to the job board or the contact us page. Yeah, and we want to think about, again, these wouldn't appear on desktop, but only on mobile. And, and what it allows the smartphone user to do is the actions that they're most likely to want to do are always one click away and you know nice big buttons. So if you're like me and you, you're not real accurate with your fingers, uh, you're still going to get to where you want to go um, without any difficulty. All right, search engine optimization leaks. Everybody wants to be number one for staffing in their local community or jobs in their industry, um, but we still see staffing websites with pages or sites that are not optimized at all. They don't invest in SEO because they don't like that it's a lot of work and it costs extra money. Um, so they don't invest in it. Or they have a bad strategy. And the picture you see on screen you know, is everybody wants to be, I wanna be the best staffing agency in Boston. Um, but what if somebody else said just best recruiting firm in Boston or somebody else typed in top staffing company Boston or somebody typed in IT staffing Boston? The strategy of trying to rank for one keyword search is really a bad strategy. It's not that you don't want to rank for being the best staffing company in Boston if you're in Boston. It's that you want to get more people coming to your website from SEO, not worry so much about am I number one for this one search, but am I ranking for lots of different searches that my clients and my candidates are doing? Very often there's no content strategy. Everybody tends to think that I do SEO when I build the website and I'm done. Well, SEO is a process, not an event, and you need to think about an ongoing content strategy. If you look at any ex SEO expert in the world, if you go to uh, Google, and you know, what they'll tell you about SEO is it's about content, it's about content, it's about content. You need a plan to create really good content that resonates with your audience. 
and then not using data to drive content, looking at what do people look at on our website? What jobs are the most interesting? What blog posts are the most interesting? What pages do they visit? And using what works to create more of the kind of content that works and experiment with content that's like one step away tangentially to the stuff that works. So you're finding more content that resonates with your audience. So how do you create a better SEO strategy? Number one is you need someone who knows how to do keyword research. So we use Ahrefs and SEMrush are two different tools we use to research to figure out what are people searching for? What keywords are they looking for and how competitive are those keywords? So we can figure out realistically, where can you compete? Then when your site is built, you do on-page SEO, at least some of the top level pages, your services page, each of your individual specialties pages, which you do want to have, each of your individual locations pages, which you also want to have, profiles of your team members. Uh, ideally, you've got a tool that allows you to have all of the profiles aggregated on a page, but each person has their own web content that's optimized for SEO. I didn't put jobs on here because we already covered it, but jobs pages, you want your on-page SEO to be done on all of the core pages that aren't gonna change that much, but are the foundation of your website. Then you wanna have that ongoing content plan, jobs and how they're gonna be optimized. Blog posts, are we using research to figure out what to optimize, what to write about, and are we regularly writing content? Are we creating case studies around specific specialties and industries, maybe even the names of employers because there's probably more candidates searching for your clients by name than searching for you by name. So let's take advantage of that. Are we getting testimonials that we can add throughout the website? And are those being optimized for searches? And are we building talent profiles? Here you see an example of the talent showcase software, which allows candidates that you would be trying to skill market or your MPCs, most placeable candidates, you can build profiles of these people, keyword rich. Each profile is its own optimized web page and then you put them on your website so clients can search them and request more information on candidates that look interesting. So you're both skill marketing and helping SEO with a showcase. And then content engagement. You know, are you doing things to suggest related content to your candidates and employers so you keep them on your site longer? The longer people are on your site, the better it is for SEO. Are you re-engaging people with email and text messaging to bring them back to your website when there's new information posted, jobs and blogs that they'd be interested in? Is your team involved in daily, regular social sharing on Facebook and LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, so that you're building your social brand, but you're bringing people from social to your website? Are you using pay-per-click advertising, particularly on Facebook, it's gonna be the most cost-effective, to promote content to bring people to your website who may not have searched for a job before, but may be interested in the ideas that you have and the ways you can help them in their career or help them in their recruiting. All right, and that brings us to our last big leak, analytics. Are you looking at the data? A lot of people are not looking at the data. They're not looking at which pages are their biggest entry and exit pages. Where do people come in and where do they leave? I wanna know where they're coming in so I can optimize those pages. I wanna know where they're leaving so that I can do something. If they're leaving too early, I can do something to get them to go to take an action. Do I know where our traffic is coming from in the trends? Are we getting more traffic from search engines or is it going down? What content are people going to? What are they looking at? What's the most popular? And do I know what keywords are driving traffic to our website? And you're gonna need a variety of tools to do this. Um, you need Google Analytics. If you've got the things like uh, SEM Rush or Ahrefs, you can see the keywords that are driving traffic. Um, but you wanna use these tools to be testing new content, new strategies, and adjusting your website because SEO is something that ideally is done ongoing. It doesn't have to be done every day, even every week, unless you have a very big website. But once a month, or at least once a quarter, are we doing things to add content and adjust our SEO strategy? So we want to be using data to make decisions. I mentioned Google Analytics will give you a lot of this data. If you're a Haley Marketing website client, you have an ROI dashboard like the one shown on screen that allows you to see how many people are visiting your website, how many are new, how many people are looking at your jobs, how many people are applying, how many people are filling out forms on your website, 
Where is your website traffic coming from? Where are your applications coming from? You want to be reviewing this about once a quarter. It doesn't have to be more, but about once a quarter just to see what are the trends, what can we learn, and what do we want to adjust in our website, our SEO, and our content strategy. And a few final considerations. These aren't really strategies, but a few last things to think about in our last minute. Hosting. Do you have a host that's optimized for the content? content management system your website is built upon. It's not just about who's the lowest cost per month, it's about the best performance and who's keeping your site up to date, who's protecting your website from security threats. Flexibility, do you have a content management system that's easy enough for you to use? Can you go there and add blog posts? Can you add pages? Can you adjust copy? Can you easily add testimonials and categorize them? Can you add team profiles or do you have to know how to be to be a developer to do all this stuff. You want a site that is a non-developer, you have the flexibility to add to and adjust. Support, who's gonna be there when you have questions? Is there a team that's available to answer questions? Uh, is there a help center where common Q&A or training videos are available? You want somebody who's there, because a lot of times you may find that your free time to work on your website are nights or weekends. Well, you want at least a database of answers available to you when you're working on your site or place you can submit questions. And coming up soon, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act Compliance. Uh, this is a big topic last month at the Staffing Law Conference. Uh, we're seeing an increase in litigation against employment related sites that are not ADA compliant. And just to let everybody know, we've been studying this. We actually had a, a full-time individual who spent about eight weeks going through the laws. We're working on it. There's a lot to developing a truly compliant website and a truly compliant career portal. We're in the process of actually gutting how all of our base websites are built to ensure that we'll be building compliant sites and we'll be making major modifications to even our current career portal software to ensure that it is usable to someone who is site impaired. And that's really the big compliance issues is, can your entire website be used by somebody using a screen reader? I will tell you from looking at almost every web staffing website that I've seen, none of them are. And right now, you need to start thinking about how do we make adjustments? If you're a current client of ours, we're looking at it. Um, but it is a major change into how websites are built. It was, it's all, the ADA Act has been around for a long time, but compliance litigation is now growing. And as an industry, unfortunately, uh, the attorneys have found that we're a good target. So we have to be thinking about the next generation of our website um, being built top to bottom to be compliant. All right, if you need more ideas for your website, um, one of the things that we offer as a freebie is our staffing website features idea list. It's a checklist, things you might want on your website. So if you'd like a copy, just shoot us an email or give us a call. Uh, info at haleymarketing.com is the best place to reach us or 888-696-2900. We'll be happy to get you a copy of the checklist that you can use for planning. And with that said, um, we are just over the hour mark. Um, thank you very much much mark for joining us today for your insights on design and the building of websites we'll stay on the line for a little bit if there are any last minute questions uh, if not while we're waiting for questions to come in i hope you will join us next week uh, as our team will be doing a product demo webinar and we're going to talk about social recruiting um, a little bit of it's going to be educational as we recap some of the core strategies for attracting active and passive job seekers on social. And then we'll get into some of the specific products that Haley Marketing Group offers to help you with attracting those candidates through social media. All right, I did have one question that's about the ADA compliance. So it's about 501 compliance. And uh, Lisa, I'm going to tell you, I'm not the person who's been studying the ADA compliance. So I am I know it is the WCAG 2.0 compliance. And I'm not sure if the 501 is part of that or not, um, but there are a couple of sites that we've been researching. And the gentleman who's been doing that for the last eight weeks would absolutely know the answer to the question. I apologize that I don't specifically know if, uh, if that is part of the regulations we've been studying. But the WCAG is the website guidelines that have been around for a number of years. There's three variations of those, kind of like a 
good, better, best. The best is almost impossible to comply with and it's not legally mandated. The middle level is what most staffing websites will need to be at to protect themselves. That's what we're designing towards. All right, well, there are no further questions at this time. So I wanna thank everybody once again for being part of today's webinar and we look forward to seeing you at the next Lunch with Haley event.